Welcome to the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast. Hi, I'm David Manti, and welcome to a new episode of the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast. With me this week is Phoebe Dupre, CEO of Goddess Growers. Thank you very much for joining me today, Phoebe. Thanks for having me. Before we get started, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You can also help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. If you want to email the podcast, you can reach me at david at cannabisequipmentnews.com with email the podcast in the subject line. You can also subscribe to our daily newsletter. Make sure you get it delivered to your inbox first. So Phoebe, thanks again for joining me. And I always like to get a little bit of background. What was it that brought you to cannabis? Um. Well... I am, I've been a lifelong consumer of cannabis and it's really just been there on my personal journey um, really, you know, pretty early on in my life. Um, and so that that was how I entered uh, or first found the plant. And then I started in the cannabis industry, working in the cannabis industry about four years ago. Okay. No. Uh, so was it uh, your personal journey? Was it edibles or flour or a mix of both? Yeah, so you know, it's it's been a real variety. Um, you know, originally I was sort of more like about socializing with friends um, and smoking a joint. Uh, in my twenties, I, I had a pretty busy job. It was high stress. It was more like in the evening. Again, like probably more of a bowl of flour. Um, and then my thirties had a bunch of kids in a row. Life with bananas, you know, and just looking for something more discreet. I got really into edibles. Um, but, you know, really wanted something, you know, more fast acting, uh, discreet packaging, delicious tasting, you know, give me that calm high without making me tired. So um, four years ago, where were you at and why did you decide to make the jump? Um, so, you know, I uh, let's see, I had stopped. I, well, I say I stopped working. I had three kids in a row and I was a full time mom for a little bit. And like I said, you know, I was uh, consuming these edibles and I just, I wasn't seeing what I wanted as a consumer in the market. Um, and early on in my career, I worked in, in research, you know, and so I, I started kind of taking a look because I love the plant. And uh, I started to just notice what I thought was an opportunity in the industry. Women are over half of cannabis consumers. And when you think about the woman purchaser, um, you know, we make 80% of, of uh, health and wellness purchase decisions for our households. We care for our parents disproportionately that are aging, make purchase decisions for them. You know, if I like something, I tell my friends about it. You know, and I, I really started to drill down on that. Um, and then also looking at the stage in life and, you know, as a consumer, what it was at the end of the day that I really loved about cannabis. And, you know, it's really the sense of calm that it provides me. It, it relaxes my body, it slows my mind, and it really kind of lets you be a little bit more in touch with that spiritual side of yourself, you know, and just makes you feel really like you could, you know, tackle anything, I guess. Was that the high stress work environment? Because being a stay at home mom with three young kids, I can't think of a more high stress environment. Yeah, no, totally. And I, I always catch myself because I say, well, I stopped working. I'm like, no, actually, I, you know, worked harder than I ever have in my whole entire life. Um, around the clock. So yeah, you know, totally high stress. Um, and, and really, you know, just trying to find something that's discreet that works quickly to take the edge off. My main message also is, you know, I'm a mom. I, I don't always want to get super high. Sometimes I just want to like take the edge off, you know, and still be really present. Um, and so there's also like a ton of education out there because I think sometimes there can be the perception when you consume cannabis that you're, you have to be high and, you know, like totally tuned out, which isn't the case. You're right. It's very much, uh, when people think of stay at home parents, I think there is this negative stigma and it's just one, you know, like whenever I have a day off with the kids, it's just like, all right, once they go to bed, apologize to my parents and then go about my business. <laughs> <laughs> totally. And sometimes I, you know, I don't like to consume alcohol that much. It doesn't make me feel very good. You know, I have a hangover in the morning when my little girl wants to get up and make pancakes. So, you know, also consuming cannabis, like it's a great way to take the edge off and then, you know, feel your best self the next day. So once you realized that the market just didn't have what you were looking for, where did you start? You know, I, I started reading 
everything I could out there and listening to, you know, experts in the industry. There's so many panels that you can, you know, hop onto. Um, and that was like for a good two years of research. And then also trying to locate, you know, I don't need to be the best at, at everything, but being really good at locating the people who are. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, I, I started to kind of really focus on the edible category. Um, and I wanted something that there, there were sort of two areas that I wanted to focus on. The science of it and the arrangement of cannabinoids are super important. And so, you know, talking with scientists, understanding the relationship between cannabinoids, what research is this existing? Um, there's so much research to come to, you know, there's over a hundred cannabinoids. We hear about a handful, um, the most, and they each do something different. And then when you put them together in different ratios, they can do something different. So, you know, trying to kind of find the team that of scientists that really understood arrangements of cannabinoids, um, and, and help me to come up with a formulation that would help to, you know, have this hybrid sense of calm during the day. And then a food scientist, I, you know, I really wanted to have a, a product that was scalable because, you know, oftentimes you find a, a recipe you like, but the minimum order quantity, and this is getting more into the back end of the manufacturing, but for the folks in the manufacturing world, you'll appreciate, you know, the supply chain, you got to, you know, recipe you like, and then one of the ingredients, you can't order more of it. So, you know, I wanted to make sure that I created something that uh, tasted delicious, you know, on a small scale. And then as we, you know, are selling into more markets, we could scale it up. So um, I located a food scientist. She's one of a dozen hydrocolloid experts in the country, which was important to me because cannabis, you know, the the distillate, it's oil-based. And I'm, I was, I had chosen a gummy at this point. It's going into a water-based recipe. So that's super important. So really trying to find, um, you know, an informed group that could advise our company on um, the formulation, both on the food side uh, and then, you know, on the science side. So what is the arrangement of cannabinoids that you went with? Um, so we're starting out, uh, and I like to say that we're constantly iterating, but we landed on five milligrams at full spectrum to start. I will all day long parrot about the the natural state of the plant, you know, is is really, it, it offers so much that, you know, I think we're just on the tip of the iceberg of really understanding um, the cannabis plant and all it has to offer. So really starting out with a full spectrum distillate um, and then elevating certain cannabinoids. So we've got a, like a five milligram uh, full spectrum CBD, and then five milligrams of THC and one milligram of THCV. And then we have a proprietary blend of uh, terpenes and flavonoids that we're calling the mother elixir. Um, and, and that's, I would say, of everything we're doing, probably our, our secret sauce that really we found when we were testing the market. Um, and we did go through several iterations. Um, it augments the the feeling of calm. You know, I'm talking a lot about cannabinoids arrangement of cam, arrangement of cannabinoids, but then it's it's also important to remember the terpenes and flavonoids because they play a part too. That was one thing that stood out to me was uh, the idea of this this mother elixir. Is there anything else you can tell us about it? I understand that it's proprietary, but just to give us a little bit of a better understanding as to what it is. Yeah. Uh, so there are you know tons of different terpenes out there and looking at certain ones that uh, provide a sense of calm. And then in different ratios, um, I would say like around the limonene, linalool, I could kind of like share some of those sometimes can provide a sense of calm. Um, and then the flavonoids, you know, that I guess I should step back for a second. Everybody's endocannabinoid system is unique and everyone has receptors in different places and everyone's going to have a unique relationship to the plant and to the terpenes and flavonoids. So when I talk about these things, you know, we're trying to kind of augment the sense of calm, but everyone's relationship is going to be different. And so that's the first thing, you know, getting blasting out that finding your right dose is very important. Um, and there's not necessarily a one size fits all, but we're trying to get like a one size fits most out there. Um, so I don't know, does that help answer the question? It, it, it does. But, uh, to your point with everyone's system being a little different and, 
what is the R and D side of it been like trying to find this one size fits most? And, uh, have any, have you had any misses in terms of like, no, this is definitely not the calm I'm looking for. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I would say around the THCV, we had a jacked way too high initially. And THCV is an interesting cat because in certain clients, it can, it can really, uh, do a wonderful job to provide a, a sense of calm and, and more on the focus side and too high of a quantity can actually create a sense of anxiety, the opposite feeling. Um, and so the, the R&D, we would focus first on cannabinoids and getting those right. Uh, and this is also where a startup and my test process is really, you know, um, using a, a group of people in my target customer age bracket Um you know, using 50 people. So this isn't like thousands of people that we had, um, you know, to, to test on, but getting them to try a formulation and then report, you know, how they're feeling, we would ask certain questions and then you can only change one part of the formula. So it, it does take a long time. You know, you can't then try change a bunch of factors. Cause then you don't know if each factor, you know, is, is actually, um, what the impact is in the formula. So that was sort of, that was how we did it in the longer term. I do have grander aspirations to, um, you know, test on actual human neuron cells, test our formulation. Um, and, and you can do thousands of those tests in a day. That's a, a larger purse to, you know, to afford that. So once we're in market, I would look, you know, that would be like our R2, but, um, to start, it was, uh, you know, test in 50 people, a formulation and then adjust the level of cannabinoids. And when we got to a place where everyone was describing a sense of calm, they weren't, I, it was also important to me to not uh, be wanting to fall asleep. Uh, I want you to have a great night's sleep, but that's just not our area of focus. I want you to be calm during the day. Um, and so when we got to the point where we felt comfortable with the cannabinoids, then we started to work on the terpenes and flavonoids. And that part that took a while. Um, and I would say that the research there is it's ever evolving. Um, and, and so that, you know, right now we've got this starter formula that we're really excited about. Um, and I, I can't wait to have the broader market try it. So one thing about the cannabis industry is that when a new market opens up, it's kind of like anything will sell. So how did you pace yourself and want to get it right to achieve sort of the effect you were looking for versus kind of like the thought of, man, if we just get something on the market, money's going to start coming in. Well, I think it's more important to get it right first. Um, and I'm personally remember interested in creating a product that I didn't see that I want to consume. And I think that there's a lot of consumers just like me out there. Um, and at the end of the day, too, as a founder, it's very important to me to have something that's not only, you know, safe to consume, but efficacious. And then I'm going to be able to provide it um, as we grow. And, and it just takes time. So the short answer is it's really hard to hold myself back. I have wonderful um, advisors and consultants that have, have guided me on the way. And every time I, I say, well, can we just get it out there? And I say, yeah, but you, you need to think about this. And uh, the process. And um, I think the biggest challenge as a startup founder is in managing my anxiety around the slow pace that things take to come to fruition. But I believe in the longer term, it will benefit our consumers and and we'll, we're creating a brand that they can really rely and trust in the longer term. So I'm okay with the, the delayed start. As the founder, do you find yourself facing any obstacles that are unique to yourself being a woman-owned business in cannabis? Um, you know, I think sometimes people, a lot of times, in fact, when we are talking to manufacturers, judging the possible success of the brand, they would say that, you know, looking, they would see a woman founder and think I'm just looking at selling to women, which isn't true. We're really selling to anybody that is looking for an edible that will give them a degree of calm. Uh, but they would say that it's a little bit too niche. Uh, I would get that a lot. You know, 
women are over half of cannabis consumers. What are we calling the U.S. markets? A hundred billion by 2030. And I'm offering a study on half if you want to pigeonhole me into women. But I would argue men suffer from anxiety and desire a degree of relief at times as well. Um, so, you know, that's probably unique. You know, I would imagine the guy brands they talk to maybe don't necessarily say, well, this is a little niche. You're looking at, you know, creating an edible. So maybe that, but uh, I don't necessarily think of that as a challenge. It's more an opportunity. Great. Like keep thinking that's niche. It's more for me, you know, to conquer that area. Cause I think it's a, a huge market and a, a big uh, wide open opportunity. Yeah. It's kind of hard for people to clap back on calm and inner peace. It's not like I hear that. and I'm like, you know what? Not for me. No. <laughs> um, so, uh, what equipment did you use during the initial R and D phase? Like, were you, uh, making these in your kitchen or, uh, what was the setup like? No, uh, in a CGMP facility that my food scientist has in her lab okay. is where you're making them. Okay. And then is that where you'll be doing your manufacturing or are you going to rely on a co-packer? Relying on a co-packer. Yes. So, um, and that, that is a, a huge part of our value proposition to consumers is this research we do around who we're developing relationships with. You know, I'm always looking for that triad of, uh, industry know-how, capitalization, and ethics. Um, you see a, a myriad of levels of those three across the board and operators. Um, and so, you know, making sure that the product is being developed in a, a manufactured in a facility that's CGMP, you know, it's food. It's not currently overseen by the FDA, but the way we operate is it will one day. And so we just want to make sure, because at the end of the day, it's you know, it's not being consumed any differently, it's still going into somebody's human body. So we want to make sure that it was, you know, um, manufactured in a, a really clean facility with good SOPs, good quality controls in place. No, I think that's smart. And it helps kind of mitigate any risk in the future as you expand. Um, what was it that drew you to the Ohio market? Well, if I'm being honest, I'm from Illinois and Illinois, the rollout process with the licensing was just so darn slow. And Ohio is an excellent market. Ohioans will, you know, for consumer packaged goods, just in general, they're willing to try something new. Um, it's, it's currently a medical state, but they just voted to go rec. And so we kind of, we knew that was on the horizon. Um, I, my, you know, in the background, I'd like to own my own backyard first Illinois is taking a long time and we had the branding assets and the, the formulation ready. So uh, I turned to Ohio and it was also honestly a combination of, you know, we were ready to go. And then I was able to find that uh, manufacturer that, you know, has that cannabis industry knowledge, the ethics, the capitalization experience. So. Yeah. How did you arrive at the partnership with, uh, is it Benaleaves? Yes. Benaleaves. Mm -hmm. How did that come together? Um, you know, it was, it was over some months. And um, I will say that uh, one of my mentors once said, honor the process uh, as, you know, the co in co-packing when you're negotiating a contract. It's sometimes it, it took me, gosh, it was probably about a five month negotiation. And again, it's, it's managing that anxiety around the slow process, but you start to see how people behave in a variety of situations and you can start to judge, frankly, how they'll be as a partner. Um, and so, you know, it, it was a lot of phone calls, visits on site, you know, um, I think the visits on site are really important because you can also not only look at the facility, but then, you know, the employees, are they happy? Are they psyched to be there? Um, are they doing everything they you know say they will? Benelieves is doing that and more. I mean, they've created, they have really talented folks working there. Um, they take a lot of pride in, you know, um, the creation of the products, the cleanliness of the facility. Um, so I think Bill Williams, the CEO, has, has built a really incredible business there. Uh, but it, it was just a lot of back and forth uh, negotiation, like any other, you know, contract. What are your expectations for sales just in the medical market? Um, so limited again, think of me like, uh, the tortoise and the tortoise and the hare, um, we're, we're launching in a few weeks, uh, intentionally 
just on a few shelves. I want to really get proof of concept and make sure that my formulation is resonating the way we think and the brand is resonating the way we think. If we have to make any tweaks, we will. Um, and then we'll slowly build up. So really looking at organic growth um, and getting consumers interested, loving the product, buying it again. Um, and and so that's sort of our approach and how we're looking at sales. Okay. Um, when is Ohio expected to go full rec? That is the golden question. So um, the date keeps changing from my distant eyes. Uh, for a minute, it was seeming like it'd be in the spring. Now it looks like the fall or the winter. Um, and the hope is that it's, you know, by the end of the year, but could it bleed into the next year? Sure. It's just, it's really hard to tell. Um, you have a lot of great people hard at work at the state level trying to, you know, roll out a brand new industry. So with rose colored glasses on, I say, you know, I think they're, they're doing a good job. Um, they're doing their best to roll it out in a, you know, a really good equitable way. Just takes time. In the meantime, do you still have those eyes set on Illinois or any other markets where, you know, are you currently looking for additional uh, manufacturing partners? Always. Yes. So any, you know, co-packers listening in, um, we are always having conversations. That's what I've been doing for the past few years. So, you know, I, I tell my um, advisors that I feel like I'm painting the road that we're going to drive down, down. So, you know, I'm right now I'm talking about Ohio. We are working on our contract for Illinois um, I expect to, you know, head there next. And then um, we are in uh, advanced conversations with a handful of other markets. Okay. Have you had, have you been, as you've been looking into other markets, have you had opportunities where you've kind of had to walk away because it just wasn't a good fit? Yes. Uh, and it's a letdown. Uh, and, you know, but those experiences, I think they make you better, faster, stronger, because I learned, you know, you have a couple of phone conversations, but I really want to get on site as fast as possible, make sure that, you know, the facility looks and feels exactly the way it was advertised. Um, but there there have been a few, but, you know, you learn as you go. Yeah. Well, I do like the idea of honoring the process, but I see how that could conflict, you know, with partners and perhaps cause some frustration with other people that are interested in the business. Give me an example. Well, I mean, like uh, if you had partners that kind of, you know, like I was talking about earlier, just in terms of like, let's get it on the market and see how people respond sort of thing, rather than trying to make sure you have the best fit. Oh, I see. Um, on the manufacturer side. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, my experience has been they're in the same boat and there are steps and check marks that ha you have to, you know, get past. So, uh, you know, going into Ohio, uh, I am ready to go. And, you know, each mile marker that we, we get to, I'm ready for the next one. Um, but, you know, until, for example, we get the formulation right, the barometric pressure is different, the environmental factors are different in Ohio. So then, you know, our food scientist goes on site, we'll train the the very uh, expert kitchen at, at Ben and Leaves. They take the recipe, then they make it, and then we send it out for testing. So they're just, you know, there's, there's processes. We had to apply uh, for approval for our packaging, you know, so you can't just blitz the market and throw something out there, even if you wanted to, which I would say is not a good idea. You had actually mentioned packaging earlier particularly a more discreet packaging, what are you looking for in terms of your branding? Mm -hmm. um, so it's got to be childproof. I'm the mother of, you know, three little girls. I want something that they can't open. Um, and then on the other end, and there's some tension here, uh, when I'm anxious, I want something I can open. <laughs> you know, you're frustrated and for a while, I tried the, you know, one where you push down and you turn it and it's metal and that gets jammed sometimes. And even more so when I'm frustrated, um, the bag, you know, meh, the bag in my purse wasn't really doing it for me. We landed on, um, it's a puck shaped package and you pinch it on the sides and it makes a really satisfying pop when you open it and when you close it. So you know that it's that it not only airlocks the, the edibles inside, but it also uh, lets you know that it's closed firmly. 
Um, I also, there are a variety of factors that go into it. It's, it's discreet in my purse. Um, if you have arthritic fingers, uh, you know, you can still open it. So I, I tested the packaging on a bunch of people I'd carried around my purse and, you know, like checkout line at Target. I say, Hey, can you, can you try What do you think of this? And see, you know, we tried a bunch of different, um, uh, shapes and sizes and methods. And so that was the one that, you know, was certainly childproof, but, uh, easy enough to open when you're under duress. Um, and it's, it's discreet. Uh, and then as far as the brand, you know, there's, we can put our pretty label on top. We've got something on the side. Uh, so. One of the things childproof containers presents as a challenge is in automation, just because it's hard to fill them in an automated system. Was it a, uh, a packaging, a piece, a uh, type of packaging that your manufacturing partner had already approved, or did you have to like work with them just to kind of make sure it would fit their process? Uh, so we had to uh, have it approved in Ohio by the regulatory authorities first. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's all about also like the supply chain management. So then there's some negotiation about who's labeling it. And, you know, uh, we have a little cupcake liner we put in. So you got to just sort out your supply chain, who's doing what. Um, I have a great packaging company I really like, you know, and and they're labeling it for me. You know, and then it gets on site and gets filled up, and uh, then Ben Leaves is putting the you know final regulatory required pack, uh, labels on it. With all the uh, kind of starting and stopping, trying to find the perfect product, did you ever run into a couple of roadblocks where you're like, you know what, maybe this isn't going to work? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Never. I, I love cannabis so much that I was determined to find, you know, I knew that there was the end product and just really honoring the process and thoroughly researching to get there. Uh, there's never anything that made me throw my hands up. If anything, like there are challenging times and things that happen. I think, gosh, that was scarier. That was weirder. I can't believe that person did that. But uh, I think of it more like you got to go to that thousand foot view and nothing is too big of a deal to ever make me want to quit. I'm committed to finding this product. And, um, I think of it, this is going to sound super cheesy, but like, uh, somebody once told me that like the challenge as a star founder, think of it like a rock in a river and you're just the water and you're flowing around it, over it, under it. There's nothing will stop you. I don't think that's too cheesy. <laughs> So, it's a good visual when you're really frustrated with somebody or something they did. Um, so are you your product's harshest critic? Probably. But I mean, I will say it's it is a nervous moment because here we are. I mean, this is this product has my whole heart and soul in it and a, four years of work and we're about to hit shelves. And there is a little bit of that moment where you think, oh, what if people don't like it? If I'm being completely honest, but we'll know in a few weeks. And then if they don't, you know, just like I was saying, it'll be a challenge and we'll just sort it out, you know, pivot and move along. When is the official launch date? Um, that's a great question. Right now we're making the SKUs. They go out for testing. So we're selling into market the last week in March and we'll be on shelves, uh, you know, beginning of April. Okay. Are you doing any sort of actually in the Ohio medical market? Can you do any sort of like coming out events or marketing events like that? Or do you have to be kind of careful with that? A little bit careful with that. So um, really, I am putting a lot of focus on the bud tender. I'm very, and you know, if they don't talk about me, I don't exist. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we also have a, a focus on community. So the way we're going to market doesn't necessarily mean we have to have a big event with people gathering, you know, it's more individual. It also, you know, all ties back to that sense of calm. So the work that we're doing is really uh, understanding uh, the bud tenders reaction to the product, what they think, what their opinion is, uh, what motivates them, uh, what helps them out, do their job more easily. So one thing I've been curious about just as a father of two young kids also is how do you communicate with your kids as to what you do? 
well, I tell them that I work with uh, the cannabis plant and I make a product that's just for adults. And then I compare it to alcohol, which, you know, I, I hesitate because it's very different. But as far as children and explaining, that makes sense to them. You know, I say alcohol is just for adults and so is cannabis. But there's no taboo. Uh, and I think the more I talk about it and the more my kids talk about it and they know that's just for adults, it's getting the right messaging out there in my own small way. No, I think that's smart. It's uh, it's one of the things that I think... Um the industry has issues with in terms of communicating with the younger generation. Yes. And then, you know, I would also argue at that middle school age when your mind is, is still so malleable and um, you can be really influenced getting the education that you should not consume until you're 21 out there and understanding why it's a bad idea uh, is, will be helpful as well. Yeah. Um, so what are your expectations for uh, Goddess Growers and yourself and your company going forward? Uh, you know, the expectation is really uh, create this product that provides a degree of calm. We want to be your partner on the journey to calm. And right now, you know, I've got a magnifying glass out and we're waiting to go to market and make sure that, that it's working. And once we, we find uh, that our product is resonating, then we'll look to expand. And my expectation is to continue to sell um, and grow. Okay. Um, do you have any personal predictions as to when you think it might go federally legal? Oh, if I knew, then man, I would really have like a million dollar ticket. Uh, no, it's anyone's best guess. It's just so hard to determine, but it feels like it's coming. Um, Part of being a brand is I can navigate around that a little bit. I'm partnering with the people that have to work through that. Um, so being supportive and, and staying on top of it is certainly necessary, but I, I couldn't guess. It's yeah. too hard to guess because every time I hear someone talk about something, then, you know, something else will come up. Um, they, you know, it looks right now like descheduling, sorry, rescheduling rescheduling uh is is the route forward you know a couple of years ago i would have said well maybe nullification was in the mix as well are you familiar with nullification no not uh tell me about it the idea that you know a law is continuously broken and the federal government is not prosecuting so it just becomes it, they can't call it a law anymore no. that's another route but i don't see that talked about as much anymore um, if it becomes a schedule three substance that really, that would alleviate the, the industry immensely. And it just becomes a regular pharmaceutical drug. Um, and it, it, you know, there's a lot of focus on safe banking and, you know, direct access to funds for the license operators. But what I look at in addition to that is all of the ancillary businesses that can then start to do business in the cannabis industry that weren't able to before. Um, so I think, you know, if, if it can get rescheduled, fine, it should really be descheduled in my opinion, but um, I don't know. I wish I could give you a time scamp. Do you have an opinion? I feel like it changes every day. It changes actually it changes after every one of these conversations I have <laughs> because I either come out very optimistic with somebody else that's just like, you know what? No, I see it. I see it happening a little sooner. Um, personally, I, I think it might take a little bit longer um, just because right now it just seems like a political talking point. And I'm uh, I'm in Madison, Wisconsin. So I'm at like complete prohibited state, uh, prohibition state. And uh, so any movement on it, I think would be beneficial. Um, but yet, I mean, to say that it's going to happen before I would say within the next four years, I hope within the next four years, this is not me being optimistic right in this moment. <laughs> yeah. Right. I, it's, it's so tricky. And I, I used to really look at it so, so carefully. And now I've kind of said, you know what, it's going to sort itself out. Cause every time I start reading about it, I get really worked up, mm -hmm. <laughs> you oh, know, no. unnecessarily. Yeah. Well, it's, and it's the same because at first you'll find a new advocate and you'll see what they're saying. And you're just like, yes, this person is going to happen. It's yeah. happening in December. Yeah. yeah this person's going to take the ball and run with it. 
And then you realize that the next time they talk about it, it's just the exact same four talking points. And you're like, oh, no, no. It's just for a soundbite. So uh, I do find myself every, every once in a while getting a little uh, disenfranchised with some of the people that say they're trying to make it happen. Right. Well, and um, that's that's exactly it. And also, I have to say, as a star founder, there are so many shiny things out there and maintaining my ultimate focus on, you know, the task at hand and then knowing like in the periphery, this will have effect on us and really ascertaining what's the effect. Well, net net, it's as a brand, you know, we're a little bit more flexible. So then it's how is it going to affect my manufacturer? That's really, you know, what I think about. So four years ago when you got started, were you supported by friends and family? Some. Some yes, and uh, some I say, uh, you know, don't don't see the picture. They'll be late adopters. Okay, okay. I was just curious because it's uh, it seems like whenever somebody gets involved in the cannabis industry, you have like the curious, the socially curious that uh, come in. Like all of a sudden, you're an expert, and you're just like, I don't know. Um, and then you have the ones that are just like keep you at the arm's length, just like no, 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 that's not for me. Yeah, there is that. I will say that more than any other industry, it does beg an opinion more. So I certainly, people tell me exactly how they feel every single time. Um, and, and it tends to be the extremes, either really supportive or really letting me know why I've totally taken the wrong turn and, you know, uh, have made a poor choice. But I think part of that is maybe coming from a place of fear and change is hard. We're in a period of change. And there's always going to be people that need to see it in action and see mass adoption first before they can come on board. And so I simply just, I don't take it personally. I more put them in, in that category of too bad you can't see that this is a great thing and um, it's going to become very mainstream. Uh, you know, I, I think down the road, I just tell myself, you know, in five years or so, they'll come up and say, gosh, you really are onto something when you join the cannabis industry. Well, Phoebe, I really do appreciate you taking the time. Um, before we get out of here, is there anything else that you want to make sure the Cannabis Equipment News audience either knows about yourself or Goddess Growers? Um, just that we're so thankful to be entering the market. And if you happen to be in Ohio, um, please try our products and check us out on Instagram, Goddess Growers. We just launched. You know, I'm sorry. I forgot to ask one question. Like, It's like a, the first question I should have asked. Where are you sourcing your product from? Um, so in state in Ohio from local farmers. Okay. I, I was just curious because a lot of times I'm curious of the relationship, you know, especially because you're looking for a very specific, um, effect. Um, I feel like that relationship with the farmers has to be pretty tight. Yeah. So, okay. So I'm going to just drill down. How many minutes do you want me to answer this? And you're fine. we got time. Okay. Um, so there's a longer answer. By product, I thought you meant the regulated part, THC distillate. Gotcha. Um, but this is a really important conversation, right? How am I backing up this claim? Like we're going to provide calm, you know, if you're in Ohio and then if we're in another state, how are we doing that? And providing that consistency that you hear a lot about. Um, so I'm trying to control as much of the input as possible. And so we provide everything X THC distillate and the THC we can, we can control, you know, we can say we want 88% every time and that's, that's achievable. So that's coming from a local farmer. That relationship is managed by Ben Leaves. Then uh, my minor cannabinoids are coming from an outside provider and I have a contract with them and I can call out exactly what I want. As we get better, faster, stronger, I'll be able to also in the longer term, have certain plants and certain strains and have the same one every time. I, to be completely honest, I'm not there yet. Okay. But controlling those inputs and then having our mother elixir also we control. So we're sending that in. And then um, our flavoring, you know, comes from, it's all natural from fruit, fruit, fruit pulp. Um, so, you know, making sure that I'm getting that and I have my hands on that provider. Um, so we we control everything ex the THC distillate, if that helps. No, that does help. And I apologize that it took me this long to get there. Yeah, no, but it's a it's a really important question and something that we talk a lot about because you know, there's 
the full spectrum is the most important part, but then the full spectrum, what, you know, even these minors, when they, the tiniest bit of variance, somebody could have a different experience the next time. And you want to limit that as much as possible. No, I completely agree. Like I've never been drawn to an idea as much as I have recently anyways, to the entourage effect and still Absolutely. having, and having like really no real grasp of the situation other than the idea of it. Yeah. Well, and then when you, man, when you find your right dose in a product and you have, you feel that entourage effect and that perfect, beautiful high, and you just feel totally relaxed, you're always going to be reaching for that. I think. I completely agree. And then that's where the frustration sets in when you're talking about controlling those inputs, because when you do finally achieve that, but then you can't replicate it, even with sometimes the same products, it can get a bit frustrating. Exactly right. Exactly right. And I think that consumers should look for more consistency as we get, you know, deeper into the industry, because there is, I'm seeing, you know, more talk around, more and more talk around that. So. Excellent. Well, again, Phoebe, thank you so much for taking the time. I really do appreciate it. It was really nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, before we get out of here, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You can help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. If you want to email the podcast, you can reach me at david at cannabisequipmentnews.com with email the podcast in the subject line. You can also subscribe to our daily newsletter. Make sure you get it delivered to your inbox first. For Phoebe Dupre, CEO of Goddess Growers, I'm David Manti. This is the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast. 